Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Someone might ask if Miss Tesla is still in control. She still in charge? <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Now seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began speaking and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful. For, sh for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted. For righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be very glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in this manner they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you'll allow me, let me speak to you just for a moment, those who are persecuted. Father, again, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you and raise our hands towards the sky and to declare your glory. Father, Lord, to pray for one another, to encourage, Father, one another, knowing that you are our healer and our deliverer, that you give us great clarity, that you bring discernment to those who seek it. And that, Father, Lord, as we pray for one another, Lord God, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people and we know your presence is here. And Father, Lord, we have read your word and we know that in your word there is great knowledge and understanding, wisdom beyond, sometimes beyond our ability to clearly see. But I pray, Father, you would open our eyes and our hearts to it today. And again, we thank you, Father, Lord, for this word. For as it goes forth, we know that it will not come back void. And again, we just pray for your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So what two things are we supposed to remember when we look at the Beatitudes? One, they are Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are the qualities, the characteristics being developed in our lives, making us to be like Jesus. I asked you last week, how far have you come in being like Jesus? My hope is, is that we are growing every day in Christ's likeness to be just like Jesus. The second one is the Beatitudes or illogical statements of joy. If ever a Beatitude seemed illogical to the human mind and to our attitude sometimes, it's this one. How, how can the persecuted be blessed? Can you even imagine someone saying, hey, I'm so happy I have people to pick on me and beat me up. And they actually mean it. No one in his or her right mind finds pleasure in pain. Jesus must have known his followers would have a hard time with this statement. Out of all the Beatitudes, this one is the only one that Jesus repeats for emphasis. Jesus doesn't just say to the persecuted are blessed once. Jesus says it twice. We are even told to rejoice and be glad. Again, how illogical does that sound? Rejoice and be glad people are talking about you. Rejoice and be glad you will suffer at the hands of others because of your belief in Jesus Christ. As Americans, we find it so hard to rejoice and be glad if we have a bad day, let alone we should ever face persecution for what we believe. The Apostle Paul apparently understood what Jesus said. He not only knew it to be true in, in his mind, but Paul lived what Jesus said. In Acts 16, when Paul was in the city of Philippi, he was overtaken by a mob. Do you remember? He was arrested and beaten and thrown in the dungeon in chains. This is not my ideal of a good day. Most of us would have been inclined to just try and get some sleep and hope things look better in the morning. Yet at about midnight, Paul and his companion Silas were not sleeping, and they weren't up singing the blues either. 
They weren't comparing their cuts and bruises or telling sob stories. Instead, these two sore, uncomfortable, and weary men were singing praise to God and giving Him all the glory for what was happening in their life. Somebody shout amen. I understand that's a difficult thing to process in our understanding in our minds. I can remember very clearly, very clearly once, uh, I had a medical procedure that was done and I was told that there would be some, some after effects to it and I didn't experience them right away. It took a few days, but when I began to experience them, I became very weary. And I remember going home and getting in my bed and I remember the Spirit of God saying to me very clearly, John, worship me. And your pastor, with all the confidence and faith in the world, said back to God, Lord, I don't feel like it. Anybody ever been there? He said, John, if you'll worship me, you'll feel better. What do you do with that? What do you do when the Spirit of God says you'll feel better if you worship me? Well, I begin to worship him. And guess what? I what? Felt better. My, my issue didn't go away. I still had pain. I still had discomfort. But I felt better knowing that God knew what I was going through. And he would bring comfort to me when I asked for it. Oh, my, my ideal of a good day sometimes doesn't match with what God is talking about. Most of us would just want to hide under a rock. But I want you to know right now that we need to give God praise and glory even in the times of discomfort. Can somebody shout amen? Years later, Paul would write to the church in Philippi from another prison in Rome. In Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, I say again, rejoice. We have that up on the screen. Let's all say that together. Rejoice in the Lord always, again, I say rejoice. Can, can someone raise a hand towards the sky and just rejoice in a moment in the goodness and the glory of God? Can we just rejoice in who He is? Can we just give Him praise for what He's doing in our lives? Even if we don't feel like it, can we raise a hand towards the sky and worship Him? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the question might be this morning, how can the persecuted be blessed? Well, if you're taking notes, my first point is this. You are blessed when persecution is for righteousness. So if you're taking notes, you could just say righteousness. Righteousness. You are blessed when persecution is for righteousness. Listen very carefully, my friends. Jesus is not talking about being picked on. Or being made fun of. Or those who might feel like they've been mistreated. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are those who are persecuted because they live for God. Persecution is blessed by God when it comes as a result of righteousness. Pastor, then what is righteousness? Well, righteousness is the first, is first the declaration of God. Righteousness is not based upon anything that we do. The Bible says our righteousness is what, folks? Filthy rags. God says that we are righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. Not my righteousness, but righteousness of Christ that covers me and clothes me. I am so thankful that I turned in my old tattered garment of righteousness and Jesus Christ gave me his pure righteousness to clothe myself in. I don't walk in John's righteousness. I walk today in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, the one that gave himself for me. I walk in the blood of Jesus as it's been covered over my life and I walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. I listen to me this morning. God says we are righteous through faith in, the, in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus makes it possible. The blood of Jesus makes it possible for us to be made righteous. As we come clean before God, confessing our sins with the full knowledge that Jesus paid the death penalty in my place. God declares us righteous. Righteousness is also the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God within you empowers you to live a holy life. I, 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 someone will come to me or someone will say, Pastor, I can never be perfect. You're absolutely right. You'll never be perfect. But you can walk in holiness. 
How do I know that? Because the Bible says we can. You see, we walk in holiness when we allow the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to walk in that holiness. You see, I, I, can, be, I can walk in holiness because God is holy. And because God is holy and He has said, walk after me, then I can walk in that peace that He has for me. Righteousness is a life lived under the control and the influence of God's Spirit living in me. Righteousness is not forced upon you from the outside, but flows from within you by the dynamic power of God for the world to see. The Christian, and if you, you've heard me say this a thousand times, but let me say it again just for the record. The Christian should live differently from those who are not Christ followers. The values and the priorities and the goals and the desires of the Christian should produce a completely different lifestyle than what the lifestyle is of the world around us. We should shine like neon signs in the world around us that Jesus Christ is Lord over my life. And I don't give in to the things of the world or what the world is doing. But I say glory be to the King of kings and the Lord of lords because the Holy Spirit resides in me. The child of God should stick out like a sore thumb compared to the culture of our world or the American culture. Someone will come and say, well, pastor, don't we live in the world? Yes, we are in the world, but we should never be a part of the world. You see, we live in the world to be salt and light for the world to see Jesus Christ. We live in the world to be an example of what the Holy Spirit can do to a life that's been radically transformed by the power of God. I don't join in with everyone else what they're doing because that brings dishonor to God. Who hears what I'm saying? I want to be a different person. I want to walk in the glory of God, not in the glory of the world. Oh, church, let me tell you today, it is time for the church to stand up and to be counted for righteousness. Living out the Beatitudes in our daily life means that you cannot sit on the fence between Christian faith and the values of this world. And you might be here this today, you, you might be saying, Pastor, I don't understand that, con that ideal, that concept. I have met many, many people in my lifetime who walk the fence. I have family members who walk the fence. They think that as long as they go to church on Sunday, that they can live like they want to the rest of the week and it's all good. I want you to know right now, you cannot live for Jesus on Sunday and for the devil the rest of the week. You are walking a fence. And my friends, it's a dangerous fence that you're walking on. Because you are in danger of losing what God has given to you. Serve Him 24-7, 365. And let the Holy Spirit guide, lead, and direct you. You can't sit on the fence. The Beatitudes are the building blocks to be like Jesus. When we live our life consistently with these attitudes, characteristics, and qualities, and values of Jesus, our life will be different. Ephesians 2.19. Mark this scripture down if you don't have it marked. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. But are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. You belong to the household of God today. You don't belong to the world. You belong to Jesus. We are not facing persecution for our faith individually. We must ask ourselves the question. Why am I not facing persecution? Why am I not facing persecution? If you're not facing persecution this morning, you must ask the question, why? Why am I not? My friends, God's blessing comes at a price. And we must be willing to pay it. God wants us to consider the cost and the dividends. Listen to me very carefully. Last time I checked, you still cannot get something for nothing. God wants us to come to Christ with our eyes wide open. In Luke chapter 14, verse 27, And whoever does not bear his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For who among you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost to see whether he has resources to complete it? We must count the cost. We must understand and know that there's a cost to living for Jesus. There's a... There's this ideal of giving my all to Him, surrendering myself over to Him. Say, Pastor, 
my work might be tougher on me if I claim to be Jesus. Yes, it might. But let, you, let the world know this, that Jesus is still behind you 100%. And he will give you everything that you need. Jesus didn't hide anything from us. He told us like it is. If you're going to be my disciples, then expect persecution. Jesus told us in this life we can expect persecution instead of praise. Cruel insults instead of pleasant invitations. Harassment instead of honor. Abuse instead of applause. Slander instead of support. Death instead of dignity. Jesus wants us to be prepared for the difficulties that will come as a result of following him. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Who knows that Jesus is our peace? We talked about this last week, didn't we? Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. <laughs> Again, it almost sounds illogical, doesn't it? Jesus tells us that you're going, to, you're going to have a lot of strife. You're going to have a lot of things happen in your life. There's a lot of things that are going to happen. But be of good cheer. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. You will find victory in me. You will find comfort in me. You will find peace in me. You will find all the things that you need to have a successful life and to overcome temptation and to overcome lust if you'll follow after me. Will there be some hard times? Yes. Everybody say yes. But God says, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. My second point, if you're taking notes, is you are blessed when persecution is a reaction to Christ. Short reaction to Christ. Jesus said you are blessed when you endure all kinds of persecution because of me. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. I can't tell you how many times that I've introduced myself to somebody as pastor and immediately the atmosphere changes. It's not necessarily because of me, but it's because of what? Because of the spirit that's within me. You see, if Christ lives in you, it will reflect to the world around you. People will see Christ in you. And if you say and proclaim to be a Christ follower, the more you act like it, the more it shines through you, the more you're going to make people uncomfortable. Well, I got news for the world. They're, they need to get ready to be uncomfortable. Because the church of Jesus Christ shall stand up for righteousness and be the people that God has called us to be. You see, the Christian faith is not a cause. <laughs> It's not even a religion, my friends. It's not about good works. It's not about living a moral life. Christianity is about Jesus Christ. Our Christian faith is centered around a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not sure where religion will get you, but Jesus Christ will get you where you need to be. I'm not sure where anything else will provide for you or take you to, but Jesus will provide and take you to the place you need to be. When you encounter persecution... You are blessed when you remember it's not you your attackers are outraged with. It's not about you. It's about who? Shout it out, friends. It's about who? Jesus. It's not about you. See, this is where we have to grab hold of this concept. When the world is making fun of you, they're not really making fun of you. They're making fun of Jesus. I don't know if that helps you any at all. But it helps me to know that Jesus is my Lord. And that because he said they would make fun of me for whatever different reasons. For however we, we decide to follow the Lord. Listen, I get, I understand, I understand clearly. I worked for 30 years in a secular workforce. I know exactly what it means to be made fun of because of my faith. I know exactly what it means for people to, to talk behind your back. I know exactly what it means when people say to you that you, are, that you don't know what you're talking about. But I also know what it means to stand up with a loud voice and say, 
Jesus Christ is Lord over my life and always will be. Let the world see me for who I am. In the early days of the Christian church, uh, there was a zealous young man, and he did everything in his power to bring it to an end, the church. This man had believers arrested. He had them put into prison. He threatened the lives of Christians. He even approved of them being put to death. However, he stopped hunting down the Christians whom he hated when he himself became a Christian. Why did he change? He met the risen Savior. Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul was not opposing a group of people. He opposed Jesus, the same Jesus who had been crucified and lay dead in a grave for three days. But then Christ was brought back to life and now confronted the very man who threatened his people. I tell you right now, Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, he is with us. And because he is with us, I know that I can overcome all things because Christ has overcome the world. People have continued to resist Jesus even to this day. We know and see this every time we try to witness to folks. Let me just help you out right now. There will be people that you witness to that will tell you, no, thank you. No, thank you. And, and it, I know it hurts. And I know that you, your passion is for them to know Jesus because we understand and know where it is that they will go when they die if they don't accept Jesus. But my friends, it's not about you. It's about the Holy Spirit working in and on them that counts. You can't get down on yourself because someone doesn't accept Jesus as you have witnessed to them. Remember, your job is to be salt and light. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Your job is to proclaim the gospel so that people can hear. It's the Holy Spirit's job to prick the heart and see salvation happen. The Lord wants us to remember that when we encounter persecution, it's not about us. It's about Him. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Don't be surprised when people despise you or treat you unfairly. As long as they hate Jesus, they will continue to hate you. This is a principle that we must grab hold of today. There are way too many Christ followers that are looking somehow or another for justice. There is justice in the world, my friends. But a lot of us would not be happy with what it might mean. For you see, I once was guilty with nowhere to go. I once was broken and downtrodden. I once was full of sin. I once was not living the life that I know I should live. And Christ called out and said, John, do you believe in me? And I said, yes, Lord. And he said, I take away the sins of the world and set you free. That, my friends, is justice. Somebody give the Lord a clap off your praise. Not what you think you deserve. Or not what you think you're owed or not what you think that the world owes you or anybody else owes you. If we owe anything, we owe Christ, the Lord God, our thanks and all the praise that we can give him for what he has done in my life. Other than that, we need to understand that we are broken and in need of God. The Bible says we are without Jesus. We are without hope. Anybody in the house have hope today? I have hope in Christ Jesus. I don't have hope in what the world can bring me. And no matter how much the world may think that they can pay me back something, it will never reach the, the extent of Jesus Christ giving himself for me and washing me in his blood and setting me free. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. My third point is, is you are blessed when you recall Jesus' reminder. So, Shorthand, the reminder. What is the reminder? Jesus wants us to remember. We, not, not the only ones, who, that we are not the only ones who have ever experienced persecution for our faith in God. The godless people of the world have always hated Christ and in turn his followers. All of them. I guess one way to remember you're not the only one experienced persecution is to remember that you're not the only one to complain to God about it either. I know no one in the house has ever complained to God about what they're going through. I'm the only one, I know. The rest of you have it. But we know that there were others that complained to God. 
Elijah was a great prophet of God. He had been used mightily by the Lord to call the nation of Israel out of lifestyle of compromise and pagan worship. On Mount Carmel, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to see who would serve the living God. It was no contest. God answered Elijah with fire from heaven. Yet when Queen Jezebel threatened to have Elijah killed after his great victory over the prophets of Baal, Elijah ran for his life. Can you imagine? I can't even begin to imagine. Ran for his life. He whined to God. Lord, I'm the only one left. But God gave Elijah a reminder. Not so, Elijah. I still have 700 others who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You are not alone. Let me shout it out for everybody to hear. You are not alone. Let me shout it out for you to hear. Not, you are not alone. We stand together by the power of Jesus Christ to be the church triumphant, to be the church that he's called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, to see a world transformed and changed by the power and the blood of Jesus. You are not alone. Hear me this morning when I tell you isolation is an enemy of the soul. That's the reason why as I look around this room this morning, I'm so glad to see all of you here. We cannot isolate ourselves thinking somehow or another, I will overcome. I need you. You need me. We all need each other. And we need the Lord Jesus Christ to give us the encouragement to get through the day. Give the Lord a clap off and a praise. The problem is, now hear me very careful. The problem is, when we try to do it alone... And I get it. I really do. I understand there are mornings when I don't want to get out of the bed. I get that. I understand. There are days when I don't want to face what's going on around me. I want you to know today, listen to me very carefully. COVID fatigue is a real thing. I'm tired. You're tired. We're all tired. But when we start trying to go at things alone, we begin to give up hope. We might even begin to doubt God. Jesus says, remember, they have treated my other followers just like you. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that the grandstands of heaven are filled with those who have gone before us. And they are watching and cheering us on to the finish line. Somebody shout amen. God knows what you're going through. I may not know what every person here is going through this morning, but God knows exactly what you're going through. If you're alone, if you don't feel like you can get out of the bed, if depression has overwhelmed you, concern or fear is just overwhelming you. And listen, you may say, Pastor, is it possible for a Christian to have depression? And the answer is yes. But we should not live in depression. Can someone give me a shout? Because who is my deliverer? Jesus Christ is my deliverer. Can I have bouts of depression? Yes. But then I need to get up and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Because who Jesus is in my life. Somebody shout amen. amen. Pastor, there are going to be those times when I feel lonely. Yes. But that's the time when you need to stand up and say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The devil is a liar. And Jesus Christ and God is my truth. And in him I find everything that I need. Isolation, I tell you again, is the enemy of the soul. But we have people that are cheering us on. And we need to hear the cheers of those people today. My next point are you are blessed because of persecution's reward. You might just say reward if you're taking short notes. Jesus promised a blessing truly out of this world for those who are persecuted, those treated unjustly, maligned, falsely accused, beaten, bruised, or betrayed, tortured, or even killed. If you are killed for righteousness sake, because you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, then your reward is heaven. Hear me today. Please hear me today. Your pastor does not desire to die. I want to live as long as I can. But if I die, I know where I'm going. 
Heaven is my home. Can somebody shout amen? Heaven is my home. God will bless the persecuted with the kingdom of God. However, we need to remember that God does not make this blessing available to just anyone who may get picked on. If through persecution you're going to receive the blessing of God's kingdom, you have a reward in heaven. You must meet God's requirements. God's requirements. Please understand, I'm not talking about earning a place in God's kingdom. How many know that you can do nothing to earn God's favor? Who knows that you can do nothing to earn His blessing? However, for those who have been persecuted for righteousness and because of Jesus, have something to look forward to. Standing up in the face of persecution is never easy. But it's easier when we keep the reward in full view. The kingdom of heaven will be ours if we don't give up and quit. Keep your eyes fixed on the prize ahead of you. I read a book many years ago. And it was called The Heart of a Pastor. It was written by a pastor from Yakima, Washington, actually. Who, in doing some research, found that there were so many pastors that would quit. They would just quit. And a lot of times, just because of the load that they were carrying. And what he discovered was, was that they quit a day too soon. If they'd have just given it another day. Give it just another day. Give it just another day. Don't allow Satan to beat you up to the point where you quit a day too early. Get up the next day and face the day. And go in what God has given you to do. Let the Holy Spirit give you the empowerment and the refreshing that you need so that you can overcome the persecution or you can overcome the trials or you can overcome the burdens or you can overcome the stress. I don't want anybody to raise a hand, but if you're suffering from stress, I got good news for you today. Jesus Christ is the great stress reliever and he will help you today. No, it's never easy. Standing up to persecution is never easy. But let us keep our eyes fixed on the prize ahead of us. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, our light affliction. <laughs> don't you love the Apostle Paul? Our light affliction, which lasts but for a moment, works for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. Oh, I may have to go through some things here on this earth, but there is a reward. There is eternal life for those that call upon the name of Jesus. So I'm going to shift a little bit. I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to shift a little bit. If you're taking notes now, what's going to come next are points underneath the last major point. So how should we respond to persecution? How should we respond to it? Sometimes when we are in the midst of persecution, we simply need to get away from it. Does this sound strange? Does this sound strange just to get away from it? Listen, we're not promised a blessing if we go looking for trouble. It doesn't say blessed are those who look for trouble. We're not told to go look for trouble. None of us need to develop a martyr complex. Jesus knew when it was time to get out of a hot spot. On one occasion, a mob wanted to stone Jesus to death. He simply left. He removed himself. Another time, Jesus knew the Pharisees were plotting to have him killed. So again, he removed himself. He withdrew to another area. Likewise, the apostle Paul knew when it was time to leave. He was lowered in a basket from the city wall of Damascus. A plot was devised against Paul in Iconium. So he went on to Lystra and Derbe. Listen, nobody says we have to put ourselves in the, in the area of persecution. Just know it's going to come. And when it comes, here's how you're to respond to it. But don't go looking for it. Who hears what I'm saying? If you're being persecuted to the point where you're struggling, you're having a hard time, remove yourself. Somebody shout amen. Remove. Put your tennis shoes on. Go for a run. The next one under that is we need to guard against compromise. Now,
I've got some things to say here. One way to end persecution is to become like those who oppose you. You see, you sell out and you start talking like others are talking. Instead of standing up for the righteousness sake, you become those who are bringing persecution. Because you see, if you join the club, they no longer have someone to pick on. But here's what I'm saying. I'm going to tell you, I'm deeply concerned today. Your pastor is deeply concerned that there are way too many people in the church trying to use values from secular culture in order to bring about change in the world around us. Church is using humanistic values and principles. And they are completely, completely, completely unbiblical. And they're in regards to things that are front and center on the news and the newspaper today. Race for what? Ethnicity? Manhood? Womanhood? Human sexuality? We do not need the world to tell us the answer to these issues. We do not need the world to tell us what it is to give in. What we need to do is stand up and say, no, if you were born a man, you're a man. If you were born a woman, you're a woman. You don't have to run after other things. That's having a deprived mind. We are all one race. And the blood of Jesus fills our hearts. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is neither white or black or brown or yellow. There is one, and it's Christ Jesus. Christ in me. And I don't need the world to tell me how I'm supposed to respond to people from other nations, from people from other ethnicities, people that are a different color skin, because the Bible tells me how to treat them. I am to love them with an undying love and a love that says we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And because of that, I will always keep and hold you safely. Don't need the world to tell me how to respond to that. I don't need to read a book on it. Because I've read the book on it. Who is there anyone besides me that believes the Bible is sufficient for all the issues that are going on in the world around us today? Is the blood of Jesus enough? If the blood of Jesus is enough, would you give the Lord a clap offering of praise in this house? If we, listen, if the church joins forces with the world's ideal of justice, then the right message of justice gets lost. Please understand, there is biblical justice. There is. And in it, we really have no place to demand anything. We really don't. Because you see, the blood of Jesus has already made us whole. The blood of Jesus has given me everything I need. Listen, I have no right to demand anything from anyone. I have no right to demand from you anything. But Jesus has every right to demand that you are committed to him completely and devoted to him. Who would agree? Who would agree? If the doctrines of God's word are not uncompromisingly reasserted and defended in the face of persecution, then dangerous ideals and corrupt moral values will spread. We need to remember, we are called to please and obey God, not man. Peter and John were ordered to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus, but their, rest their response should be ours. Acts 4.19 whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Paul understood how compromise can take away, can take on many different forms. But the motive is the same. Compromise seeks to escape possible persecution brought on by taking a stand for Christ. The next thing that we have under that setting is probably the hardest. We need to love our enemies. We need to love our enemies. It's easy to think of a way to get even when someone has hurt us or those that we love. We can be quick to begin to scheme our retaliation against those who have wronged us. I know no one has ever done that, right? 
Revenge. Can't wait to get started on my revenge. Unfortunately, revenge is bittersweet, isn't it? We may feel better for a moment, but before long, we will get more of what we've dished out. Like the saying goes, what goes around, one more time, what goes around, be careful what you wish for. Be careful how you act. Be careful how you respond. God wants us to love our neighbors and to break the cycle, to break the cycle of revenge. Instead of lashing out at anger, we are called by God to love those who mistreat us. I've shared this before, and I, and I shared it on, on uh, Wednesday at my class, but it's such a beautiful story of David Wilkerson when he went to New York City to minister to the gang kids. And he met Nicky Cruz on the street. Nicky Cruz was a vicious man. He had never been loved. His parents were witches. They, they were devout witches. And he was raised in an environment of hate and demonic power. And he was on the streets as a young man, completely demon-possessed and full of anger. And David Wilkerson walked up to him one time and said, Jesus loves you. And Nicky Cruz hit him across the face as hard as he could and then pulled out a switchblade and said, Boy, I'll cut you into a million pieces. And David Wilkerson looked up at him and said, And every one of those million pieces will love you with an undying love. It destroyed Nicky, Nicky Cruz. It just destroyed him. He'd never been loved before. No one had ever said they loved him. He couldn't comprehend or even understand the concept of love. Yet here was this preacher, this preacher from Pennsylvania, country boy, telling me he loved me. When I just hit him up against the side of the head so hard it knocked him to the ground. How's it possible? My friends, it's only possible by the blood of Jesus. It's only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, love my neighbors? Mm, I'm not sure. But God says, love your neighbor. Not only that, love your enemies. Romans 12, 17, repay no one evil for evil. Commend what is honest in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peacefully with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to God's wrath, for it is written. Vengeance is whose? God's. God said, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty... Give him drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? We have to love our enemies. We have to love the world. We have to love those people that hate our guts. The next point is we should pray for those who persecute us. We should be praying for those who hate us. Oh, pastor, now you're really, you're really making me struggle here. The bottom line is simply hurting people hurt other people. Hurting people hurt other people. The person who injures you is often the victim of personal pain that may be buried and forgotten. They attack others in the same way that they've been hurt. Likewise, many of those who may be the source of persecution are not believers. They are people who need Jesus Christ. You know, that's really the key, isn't it? The people that are running around causing all kinds of havoc and those that are destroying and those that are hating and those that are beating up and those that are killing and those that are doing all these things. As much as we dislike it, as much as we might talk bad about it, as much as we may say, what's wrong with those people? Here's the real answer. They need Jesus. They desperately need Jesus. And we should be praying that God will touch their hearts and life somehow, some way. Jesus challenged the thinking of his day. Challenged the thinking of his day. His teaching is still radically different from what many people believe today. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard, what is, what it was, you have heard that it is said, You shall love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good, do, do, good, do, good, excuse me, do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. It is hard to love people who are not lovable. Who would agree? It's hard to love the unlovable. That's the reason why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because I want to be, I want to be baptized 
by the power of God. Prayer helps us to love the unlovable people in our lives. Likewise, we are powerless to change people. However, prayer does more than just change things. Prayer changes people. Who agrees? Why should we love and pray for those who mistreat and abuse us? They are not our real enemy. They're not our enemy. Who's the enemy? Say it again. Who's the enemy? In Ephesians 6, 12, For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Whoever's going to come and lead to worship or do the end song can come up. The Beatitudes are building blocks to be like Jesus. They are the attitudes and the qualities and the characteristics which produce in us a Christ-like lifestyle. The Beatitudes, these illogical statements of joy. Christ offers us a blessed happiness in this world and circumstances that cannot take away from us. So, let me say them again. Listen to them very clearly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes, my friend, brings great life and peace. Peace in this life and the life to come. Jim Cimbala, in his book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, talks about a time when they had just had a wonderful church service. It had been beautiful. The Spirit of God had moved in a mighty way. The altars were full. And he looked up, and down the aisle came a man who looked like he had been sleeping in his clothes for a year. He was dirty, unshaven, hair was just going everywhere. You could tell that he was homeless, a homeless man. The closer that he got to Brother Jim, you could tell that he had not bathed in quite a while. And the effects of the world were heavy upon him. Jim said the, the smell that was coming off of him was nauseous. It was horrible. He knew that most of the time when people would come to him in that manner, they were coming looking for some money. And as the man got closer, he reached into his pocket to pull out some bills. And the man got close. He looked up at Jim Simbel and he said, Sir, I, I don't want your money. I want that Jesus this woman has been talking about. Jim Simbola was cut to his heart. You see, he was getting ready to give money. And money will never solve the issues. What that man needed, what the world needs, what we need, what everyone needs, is Jesus Christ to come and wash over our hearts and our lives. Jim put his money back in his pocket. And he said he walked over to that man as dirty as he was, as smelly as he was. And he grabbed him and he pulled him close to love on him. And he said, almost immediately, you could feel love fall from heaven. And it baptized him and that man standing in front of him. And he said, that smell that just a few minutes before would make you want to vomit now smelled the sweetest smell that he'd ever smelled. God has a way of transforming hearts and lives. Pastor, will I be persecuted for standing up for righteousness' sake? Yes, 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 you will. But I promise you this, God will be with you, Jesus will be with you every step of the way. But you gotta be ready. You have to be empowered. You have to be baptized in love. 
Because you see, all the things that we are commanded to do when we are facing persecution seem to go completely against logic. Who wants to be empowered with a love that comes straight from heaven? If that's you, would you stand to your feet? I want to be empowered with a love that comes straight from heaven.